because non-Arabs are hardly present. The conference met. The conference decided that the Khilafah was an essential part of the deen, that it was bid'ah and haram to abolish it, that the Khilafah must be restored, but we don't know how to do it. So let's go back home and come back after one year. That was the decision. We don't know how to do it. But in Makkah, you had the most successful representation of the entire world of Islam. Because Britain really went to work on it. This conference is now convened, but strangely for the Wahhabi movement. Strangely for the Wahhabi movement, which is a religious movement which declares that it is bringing back the original Islam and removing all the extraneous things which had been added and cutting out all the shirk. So this is the rare Islam. Well then how come you don't even have the subject of the Khilafah in your agenda for your conference? We asked the Wahhabi movement, give us an answer. There is no answer. The answer is that the Wahhabi Saudi Alliance is now perpetrating a gigantic, a massive betrayal of Islam in abandoning the Khilafah. And so the conference takes place. But the subject of the Khilafah is not even on the agenda of the conference. Instead, Abdulaziz ibn Saud approaches the conference twice, himself in person. And he asks the conference to recognize him as al-Malik. <laughs> that his rule should be recognized over the Hijaz. When the conference had heard His Majesty the King on both occasions, and the conference is now sitting down to discuss the matter. Shall we recognize Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hijaz? The leader of the Indian Muslim delegation jumped up to speak first. He spoke first. His name was Maulana Muhammad Ali Jauhar. He got up and he told the king, get lost. We'll never do that. As soon as the leadership of the Indian Muslim delegation had established its position of rejecting the claim of the Saudi Wahhabi leadership for sovereignty and control over the Hijaz, the rest of the delegates couldn't say, mm. that was the power of a man who knew Islam and lived Islam. And so the conference ended without giving to the Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hijaz recognition. They decided that they'll meet every year, but that was the last time they ever met. This then was the response of the world of Islam to the abolition of the Khilafah. In 1930, I think, or 31, Hajj Amin al Hussein in Jerusalem felt that the ominous advance of the Jews in the Holy Land required a response from the world of Islam. So he sought to reconvene the conference in Jerusalem. But it, it was a new conference. It gave it a new name in 1930 or 31. They call it the Al-Aqsa Conference or the Mu'tamar Al-Am. And this conference also met in 1930-31, but you meeting to establish Darul Islam in a territory which is under British rule. Nothing could be more foolish than that. How can you restore Darul Islam when you're meeting in a territory which is under British rule? And you, get a, you have to get permission from the British government to hold your conference. So the conference ended without being able to do anything about it. Since then to this day, there has been no effort, no significant effort on the part of the world of Islam to restore the Khilafah. Why? Simple. Because you cannot restore the Khilafah unless, unless and until you can liberate the Hijaz, Makkar and Medina. You can't do that. 
when the Hijaz, the security of the Hijaz is underwritten by Uncle Sam. What is the replacement of the Khilafah around the world, beginning with the secular Republic of Turkey, and then an Iran which resembles a Shia Republic, but essentially is a secular Republic, and then the secular Republic of Pakistan, which of course has now become the American Republic of Pakistan. And then in 1933, the Republic of Saudi Arabia, but they're parading as a monarchy, but it's actually a secular state. Because what, it has all the trappings of a secular state. A secular state has territorial sovereignty. The state of Saudi, Saudi Arabia has territorial sovereignty. A secular state has citizenship. Once upon a time when I went to Mecca, I was Muslim. And the only difference between me and my fellow Muslim was resident in Mecca was that I was Musafir and he was second. Hmm? Other than that, we're the same. But now, I am a foreigner. If this is not Bid'ah, I should change my name. I am now a foreign national. And they are Saudis. And all the oil that Dajjal discovered underneath the soil belongs to them. They own it. So what about Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud's proclamation that this ever entire land belongs to the world of Islam? That's forgotten. That's why they hate me for reminding you of these things. The entire world is now embraced. The entire world of Islam is now embraced by the modern secular state. Now let me say to you before I leave Australia, any Muslim, whenever I talk on two subjects, a lot of people now begin to behave strangely towards me. But while it pains my heart, it will not change me. Because I do not teach Islam to please people. I try to do it to please my Lord. When I talk on the subject of riba, some people begin to hate me. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And when I talk on this subject also, when a Muslim pledges his allegiance to the modern secular state and to its constitution, which declares that Allah is no longer Al-Malik, no longer Al-Akbar, no longer Al-Hakam. The state is now Al-Malik, Al-Akbar and Al-Hakam. And the state can make halal what Allah made haram. When a Muslim pledges his allegiance, you've got to do that to get citizenship. Oh yeah. Can't get a U.S. passport without pledging allegiance. When you do that, you commit shirk. If you don't believe me, no problem. No problem. When you reach the grave, then you will see. When a Muslim goes and votes in the elections to constitute the government which will preside over this shirk, you enter into shirk. But if you don't believe me and you want to go and vote in the elections, I am not stopping you. So don't let there be any bad blood between us. I'm not stopping you. But when you enter in the grave and you find that you've entered into shirk, do not plead ignorance. That's all. Stand up like a man and take it on that day. This is now the universal shirk that the Prophet ﷺ had prophesied. He said the time would come when shirk will be everywhere, it would be so difficult to recognize it. However, as difficult as it would be to recognize a black ant on a black stone on a dark night. So if you did not recognize it before this lecture, don't be surprised, but now you know. This universal 
secular state is now used to embrace all of mankind including the world of Islam in political globalization so that eventually you have one government of all of mankind eventually the Jews will now rule the world using that structure that's about to happen we already we already made significant progress towards that day when you read this book Jerusalem in the Quran which I believe is the first and only book on the subject because you couldn't write this book before 1948 nobody could write it before 1948 not in 1400 years of this history in fact it was difficult to write this book in 1940 it's easy to write it now but difficult to write it at that time when you read this book then you'll understand why it is I say that we are now located at that moment in time when one, le one ruling state is about to give way to another that the state of Israel is about to replace the United States as the ruling state in the world